What text do you preach? I think I know, but I want to see if I'm right. What text do you preach? Uh, for God said she has appointed me another seed in the stead of Cain, who Abel slew. My subject is, you'll do it again. No, I didn't get some. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> yeah. Have a seat, everybody. So that's in the Bible, that verse? <laughs> How many have ever listened to Bishop Jake's preach and you're like, does he have the same Bible that I have? I never. <laughs> oh, I was going to tell you this. So my oldest, Elijah, the other day, can I tell him? We're on the porch. And I quoted a Bishop quote to him. And I said, you know, well, Bishop always says, ba ba da ba da, ba ba da ba da, one of these little parables that you spit out like they're, you know, just this beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautifully crafted thing, right? And he goes, oh, that's Bishop? I always thought that was a Bible verse. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is, you are so loved in the verdict home that. My kids think you wrote parts of the Bible that aren't in the Bible. That's I've how been, much you mean to us. I've never been told that before in my life. I can't make that up. That's amazing. I love you all too. What does that, what does that feel like though to have the um to be the most imitated preacher in the last fifty years? I'm not sure that's true. Assuming that it is. Yeah, assuming, assuming that that would be true, uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery. But if there is anything higher than that and more important than flattery in itself, is to find the true power of being you. Yeah, yeah. Why be a cheap copy of a great original when you have the option to be yourself? So, when you're starting to preach, say be yourself be yourself but when you're first starting to preach yourself it sucks like not as a human being but as a preacher mm -hmm. it's true so then you hear oh don't imitate anyone else but like i wanted i actually wanted to start the conversation tonight because this book is a gift and thank you for taking the time at this stage in your ministry to, sh to share this i think it's so relevant and I've, um, I've been waiting for this, you know, I think a lot of people have. Um, but I wanted to start not, not just talking about communication in general, but imitation. Okay. Right. Because imitation isn't always a bad thing, right? No. Well, okay. You want me to go past now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, it's preached like it's a bad thing, like it's a well, spiritual danger. Let, let me explain what mentorship really means. It means that when Samuel grew up and was brought by Hannah into the house of Eli, he was unable to discern the distinctives between the sound of Eli's voice and God. That is the initial stage that God sounds like the person who mentored you. Gradually, you come to a point that the umbilical cord cuts, and you have to go ahead to lay down the third time before he recognized that it was God talking and not Eli. And he says, Eli says, when you hear the voice, again, go and lay down in the same place and say, speak, Lord, thy servant here. So it is my job to gradually lead you from God sounding like me until you can hear that God sounds like God. You see? You see? And, and so that weaning process starts with him being weaned from Hannah. And now he is being weaned from Eli. That he might draw the breast milk from the breasted one himself. And thereby find the nutrition that he needs. The other thing that's important to realize is that we are looking at a generational uh, passing of the mic uh, from Eli to Samuel. And, and for Samuel can hear 
God, but cannot discern him. Eli has lost his ability to hear the voice, but can discern it. So there is... Say, say it again. Say, say, okay, okay. Okay, look. Eli couldn't hear the voice. He was asleep. Okay. Samuel, being the young people, could hear the voice, but didn't understand what to do with what they heard. Okay. We have a generation of people that can hear the voice, but they like the wisdom to understand what to do with what they hear. Eli, on the other hand, has lost his ability to hear his adventurous uh, proclivity to step out into the unknown. He's playing it safe. His eyes are growing dim. His, his senses are decaying. But his discernment is still keen. So what, what Samuel needs from Eli is wisdom and discernment. What Eli needs from Samuel is the adventurous curiosity that allows him to hear the unhearable. to bring it up because we are on the impetus of a transition now that is similar to the transition of days gone by. God said, I am going to do something through Samuel that is going to cause both the ears of them that hear it to begin to tingle. And he chooses to do it through a person who has yet to learn the confidence to hear the God that is going to do it through him. So the promise of God is bigger than the reality of the individual. And he has to grow into it, just like he had to grow into his mother's coat she brought up every year, not knowing for sure what size he would be. She, she makes the coat big enough that he can grow into it. And greatness must be grown into it. Yeah. Okay. So when you're first starting out and you're preaching or you're communicating, because this book isn't just for preachers, right? Right. But we'll talk about preaching because we yeah. love to talk about preaching. Let's do that. I want you to note that, uh, by the way, my whole goal for this experience is for you to get a little bit of a taste of, like, this would be us on a Tuesday night <laughs> and three hours have gone by. And... Um, Bishop, this is what I wanted to understand about growing into it. When you're inspired by somebody, like the way I've been inspired by you, first of all, did you have somebody that you studied the way that I have studied you? I had several. And I still do. I, I listen to every orator imaginable. Whether I agree with the message or not, I watch for the delivery the technique and the style. You can learn from litigators. You can learn from comedians. You can learn from preachers. I know the content I want to deliver, it, but the vehicle I want to drive it home in is, is a conglomerate of all of these different styles and the propensity. It's like asking a gospel artist, can you learn anything from a jazz artist? Can you learn anything from a classical pianist, absolutely. And incorporate all of those different modalities into your style. And the more diverse those modalities are, the broader your stage becomes. So what are you listening for when you're listening? Uh, I'm listening at how they connect with the audience. audience. I'm looking at how they enter the room. I'm listening at the rhythm. See, great preaching. It's almost musical. Great speaking has a rhythm. It has a cadence. It has a voice, inflection, and a tone. It has the ability to have a rhythm that is syncopated in such a way that the hearer can hear it in pace and in rhythm, so much so that if you start to speak and you draw the audience into the rhythm of the pace of the speaking through which you are conveying information, and then in the middle of the pace and the rhythm, use pause. 
The pause is what I call the pregnant pause. It, it's what David calls Selah in the Psalms. It is a moment for them to ingest, digest, and appropriate what has been spoken before. And sometimes an exclamation of the importance of the statement is the silence that you let it ride in on. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and most young preachers are afraid of the silence. Why? So they, they run to make noise because they need the affirmation that the crowd is still there. But you have to have enough confidence in the material that God has given you that, the, that it will do what it was created to do. And the word of God does not need crutches. And to those that are litigators and prosecutors and those are, who are running for election and those who are applying for a job, truth needs no crutches. If it is true, it is true. And the human ability to sense truth is utterly amazing. It is, it is not just the verbalization of paragraphs and the conglomerates of chapters. It is, we hear with more than our ears. We hear with our eyes. We hear through body language. We hear through voice inflection. We hear through pitch and tone. This is what's wrong with marriage, is that sometimes your mouth is saying something, but your body language is saying something else. And women who are particularly intuitive are not just listening at what you said, they're listening at your body language and the way your eyes flinch and the way you didn't look me in the eye when you were saying it. And all of that brings them to it. See how the women are clapping? Come on, sisters. Come on, sisters. Talk back to me. Holly! <laughs> and, and this is how the man gets trapped because he thinks, I said the right thing. But, if, but they don't understand, she's hearing with her eyes. Yeah, she's hearing with your behavior. She's hearing with how you dropped your pitch and changed your tone and looked away and did not look her in the eye and all of that says that you're avoiding the straight on gaze that comes when you are sure of who you are and what you said. <laughs> Should I drop it? We can leave it. No, it's fine. That was a great moment. <laughs> to, to understand that as an orator, and every one of us in here are orators, whether we get paid for it or not, we deliver messages to our children, to our wives, to our husbands, and our family depends on how adept we are and communicating. And here's the challenge. It is one thing to communicate a fact. Two plus two is four. Uh, whatever goes up must come down. And to communicate a fact is one thing. To communicate a feeling. Some people do not, not have not made a connection between heart and mouth. The Bible teaches is with the heart man believeth unto salvation, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So to be able to articulate, I'm sad, you know, I'm sad today. I, 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 am, I am so sad today that it feels as if I will not smile again. And I cannot explain to you fully the source of the sadness but it is as if all the color has been washed out of everything. And water does not feel wet. And though the sun rose, it did not shine. And though I am breathing, I cannot get in. And my soul is sad. To be able to, uh, to describe a feeling to the point that yeah, it can Yeah, kind of depressed all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Or, or, or I, I, I love you. I love the scent of your hair. I love the gleam in your eye. I love the way you lay your head on my shoulder. And I love the way you need me 
and I'm not afraid to show it. Well, you know, you know, what do you love about me? I love you, that's fine. What do you love? Some people do not have the, the, they have not worked out in the gymnasium of communication enough to express what they are feeling. It is not that they're not feeling it, they haven't worked out to use the skills that are necessary to communicate what is in the heart. And so many marriages explode for the lack of something that both of them have, but they drop the mic. They don't communicate effectively one to another what you need. And so you leave this woman who actually had what you needed, but didn't know how to give it for some other woman who knows how to talk it, but doesn't mean it like the woman you left. And, and, and that's also true with the men, irrespective of gender. This is what happens, and this is what happens in our country and in our world where we are talking at each other. Most of the time, couples don't really listen. In the book, I talk about listening because I think that the art of being a great speaker is being a great listener. So, so I, I, I listen at you. I listen at you. I listen at other people. I listen at everybody speak. I listen at somebody when I'm counseling. And I'm a fierce counselor because I listen at you. And I remember what you said. And I, I draw a line between everything that you shared with me because listening is more important than speaking. If I lose my ability to hear right now, gradually my ability to speak will begin to erode because I can no longer hear so my ability to speak begins to deteriorate because there is an association between hearing and speaking. So the art of being a great speaker is also being a great listener, listening at the text. Listen at the text. Now Moses, my servant, was dead. But as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Listen at a God who, who Moses dropped, and while Israel was still grieving, God turned his head and continue talking to Joshua as if nothing had happened at all. Now Moses, my servant, is dead. But as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. In other words, nothing important has changed. I am still the same. Moses is dead, but I am still the same. And I will continue my purpose irrespective of my vessel. And I am going to do it through you. Not do you want me to do it through you? Not would you like for me to do it through you? As I was with Moses, so shall, oh, it's a boss move. The text is a boss move. Yeah, it's a boss move. And so you, but you can't read it and, and get that. You have to listen at it. You have to feel the intensity of it. You have to hear the sobbing in the background of a nation of people who have lost a leader that it has taken them 40 years to love. And it will take them 400 to get over. And while they are weeping at the bottom of the mountain, God sheds not one tear over Moses. He knows exactly where he is. He will have him escorted by his angels out of the situation where they last saw him. Rather than to weep, he turned his head and said, I will continue everything I was doing through you. That's what's happening now. God is turning his head. Great leaders are passing. Great leaders are retiring. Great leaders are expiring. And God is turning his head to the next generation and saying, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And can you imagine being Joshua and being terrified because there's nothing worse than coming behind a great speaker, to come behind Moses. Yeah, I've had to preach out this before. That's oh, come on, stop. To come behind Moses and, and, to, and to have the responsibility. I wrote, don't, don't drop the mic to say to young people, number one, the mic is yours. It's not going to be yours, it's yours. 
we are still alive, but it is yours. It is your generation that must be reached and touched and maintain relevance today. And I am just telling you that the mic is heavier than it looks. Don't drop it when your feelings are hurt. Don't drop it when you're angry. Don't, don't drop it. Can I, ask, can I ask you about that? Jump, jump. Uh, in, I think it was 1997, Michael Jordan played this game. It was game five in the NBA championships, and he had the flu, and he scored 38 points. I want to hear, that's, that's Michael Jordan's flu game. I want to hear a Bishop Jake's flu game story. Like a time where you stood. <laughs> I, I can't think of a time that I didn't. I can't think of a time. I can't. I, I can't think of a time that I did. I had back surgery. They dug into my back four inches between L4 and L5. When I came out of anesthesia in the hospital with a day surgery that they were going to keep me over a couple of days. As soon as I woke up, I slid over to the side of the bed and threw my feet out and stood up on them and started walking. My wife wanted to kill me. The doctor thought I was on crack, but I heard the doctor say that if I could work, walk to the nurse's station, they would let me go home. It hurt so bad that I started sweating, but I wanted to go home. And the doctor said, let him go. He said, he's, you're not, he's not the kind of guy you can keep and let him go, let him go home. And, and, and I, I have always been a fighter. Now watch this. With the pain that came, there's still a certain amount of anesthesia in you after the, the anesthesiologist has woken you up. You really don't know how fully, how you feel for a day. When I came out of complete anesthesia and the pain is riveting and I had a chance to speak, maybe not that Sunday, but the following Sunday, I sat in a chair in front of the stage to prove to the devil that I don't need my body. I don't need my body to be able to preach. There is something going on between my heart, my head, and my mouth that requires nothing on my back. And I sat in the chair with my church packed and, and, and I, I, I spoke irrespective of pain. This is the tenacity that I pass to you with the mic. The tenacity says I will override the way I feel and do what I was called to do. Yeah, yeah. So I prophesied as I was commanded. I did a reconciliation conference years ago uh, while the Million Man March was going on and I was criticized and I was threatened and I had death threats on my life and uh, they were going to shoot me and I put my boys in the background because I didn't want their last sight of me to be bleeding. But I walked right down the streets of Atlanta with thousands of people fully prepared to die for what I believe. If, if you believe a thing, that you are not willing to die over, it is not worthy of your faith. You know, I said this before and I'll share it with you and I want to play this off and you can tell me what you think about it. Thinking is the final frontier of privacy we have left. Our technology has invaded every other idiom of communication we have with each other, that our texts aren't safe, our FaceTimes aren't safe, our phone calls are not safe. The only safe place where there are no drones, where there are no hackers, is within the confines of my own mind. I, and with that being my final frontier, I refuse to allow you to tell me how to think. <laughs> yeah, because thinking is all I have left. And so when you, once I open my mouth, my thoughts have become public. 
And once they have been, become public, they are going to be scrutinized and criticized and ostracized. And they're going to alienate me from this group or that group or the other. But that's why I must incubate them in the womb of my mind before I birth them out of the canal of my mouth. Because once a thought is birthed, I'm sorry doesn't always retract it. When you're, I think you said incubate them in the womb of my mind before I birth them through the canal of my mouth. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> no, 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 no. I want to say something. Is it gross? Well, no, no. It's gross that you can do that without ever thinking about it and just say <laughs> stuff like that. It's sickening. It's maddening. The word logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, the word was God. Logos doesn't begin with speech, it begins with thought. That God is pregnant with thought. That, that he created what he thought. Everything we have on, somebody thought it. And then they drew it. And then they got a material and they sewed it. And then they made it, but it started as a thought. The chair was a thought. The building was a thought. The pulpit was a thought. Everything starts at the top. In the beginning was the thoughts of God, and the thoughts of God was with God, and the thoughts of God were God. And out of the abundance of his thoughts, he spoke, and it became 